Um, I trimmed grapevines while I was pregnant and I got to a point where the birds just drove me crazy in the heat of the summer and I was pregnant and then we bought a house in town and I started my first little garden and then we escaped that because of the heat and then we went to a permaculture farm because we were up visiting family up in the region and he got a job and the guy at the, at the kitchen with them said, oh, you've got to check out this farm. And so the, he, they took us to this farm and we'd just recently become homeless because the gay brother kicked us out because I said he wasn't really gay, he just was afraid of women. And <laughs> so, and it was true because he ended up marrying a woman. Um, but anyway, he, um, we went to this farm and everybody was naked and covered in mud because they were doing a whole Chinampas workshop. And I'm like, I'm home because <laughs> I, I, first seen permaculture at my massage school in Northern California and I didn't know it was permaculture I just thought man they have the coolest gardens and everything and I was just like I walked in oh this place looks like heartwood and so anyway that was my introduction to permaculture and then when I was studying we watched Bill and Mollison videos if you guys haven't seen Global Gardener please watch it and there's another one called In Fear of Falling Food and that's um, about what happens when the airplanes have to deliver food. We were watching all that and I just thought, permaculture is so, it makes so much sense. And I was living it, I was eating it. And I thought, why doesn't the whole world do this? And so I lived, I moved, had moved to Park City, Utah, up in the ski industry. And I, I'd done that between living in Chile in the winters. And so I went back to Park City and talking to all these millionaires about the value of soil, they just, you know, and then when you're at high altitude, nobody really cares about farming anyway. And the people I did talk to ended up really getting into it, became farmers and started the farmers market. So, so you never know what you're going to say. And I, Karine's speech was just so right on. And I don't care where you guys are in your in your walk. It, like this, you know how at the end of a permaculture design course you have to do a skit. Well, we did this skit. It's it's true. It's part of the course. You have to because you have to start getting up there speaking about something. And this guy and I, who we, he's one of the big teachers over in Reno and does a lot of stuff, um, we were making fun of all the times that we're trying to talk people into permaculture and in all the rebuttals that you typically get. Like, well, who cares about that? Well, who's going to care about that? Well, finally the time has arrived. And literally, I have been talking permaculture for 23 years, because that's how old my daughter is. And now she's in college at MSU, studying agroecology, and I'm like, I'm like, you can just study the books on my shelf. You don't have to go to college. Oh, mom, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, she's actually right now she's doing all these catering, like seasonal Montana out of Bozeman, and it's farm to table dinners. And there's this whole network nationally of farm to table dinners. So if you guys ever want to get into a business, I'm doing the permaculture Airbnb, and I love it when people come to my house for two hundred fifty dollars a night. And I just go camping. <laughs> okay. So meeting human needs while building and enhancing ecological systems through processes and methodologies, seeing patterns. Uh, seeing patterns is something you start to develop when you get into the permaculture thing. Like you see the patterns in your life. Like, oh, I always do this. I always fall for that. You know? So and seeing the patterns of what your garden, you know, your morning glory, your bindweed always is huge by June. And if you cut it in enough oomph to produce seeds in the fall and you don't have to worry about it. So, and I will put a pitch in right now. Everybody has to go on Amazon and order a Japanese serrated sickle, the comma, because when Skeeter gave me my first serrated sickle, it changed my life. I'm no longer worried about weeds. When my mom uses the word invasive, I just say, mom, it's a lack of harvesting. I gave you your serrated sickle. And I usually buy 10 because it is the very best and cheapest present I can ever give to anyone for their birthday or Mother's Day. Really, they're like 5 to $7. And I challenge anybody to go on like Alibaba and order 1,000 and start selling them to your local uh, you know, gardening shops and, and, and Ace Hardwares and stuff like that because they are literally the best tool out there. And it's, you know, if people harvested rice, you certainly can harvest your weeds. And I always say, you know, it's really about harvesting the weeds because you're harvesting them as mulch. Even bindweed is the best mulch. I've come to love bindweed because I don't try to dig it out anymore. I mean, I had 15 puncture wounds in my, in my sprinkler system because of trying to dig it out. So localization of food, that's what she was saying. You have to get back to really focusing on teaching your community to localize food. Labor exchange, you know, there's all kinds of labor exchange websites and stuff like that out there. Energy independence, um, 
So localization of food, local labor, and local energy independence, those are the three tenets of Transition Initiative. And if you guys watch a YouTube movie called Transition 101, and then they have Transition 201. And that's how to speak the, the common language. Like they say, it's hard to use the word permaculture, but you can talk about the three principles of Transition Towns movement, which is linking your neighborhoods, and, um, and it's about local food, local energy, and local labor. So you find out who, you map your neighborhood. So it's finding about what are the patterns, how can we support our neighbors? You know, can you get the, the plumber down the street versus the plumber from a different town? Okay, in the winds of extraordinary change, sustainable designs, agroecology, community development, and backyards to bioregions. Okay, so start locally and move globally. I liked her question, what would you do? What changes are you going to make? And my big one is that I want to do is I want to start a podcast in Spanish because I speak fluent mm. Spanish from living in Chile. And, and so I, I've gotten permission from all these awesome podcasters, and we'll get to that on this, um, to do it in Spanish. And if you go down to South America and Central America, you'll see how some of them are close to ancient ways, but they're so far from it because Monsanto is alive and well, and the Green Revolution is alive and well, and they haven't evolved. It's kind of like feminism, like, you know, it's like we've been there, done that, and it's, you know, like in Chile, it was just happening when, you know, when I when it was in the 60s here, but when I was there in the 80s, it was just happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't let me do rabbit trailing, because I do that way too much. <laughs> okay, so, you can't really see this too well. Um, so, permaculture is based in the prime directive, which is see to your own needs and the needs of your posterity, your children. If everybody can see to their own needs first and the needs of their children first, then we won't be having all these people dependent on everyone else and being a burden on everyone else. So, seeing that that's the prime directive for your life, then um, the permaculture ethics are, of course, in this in this order, care of the earth, care of people, and then fair share. Because if you don't have earth, you're not going to have care of people. So, and through care of the earth, it's really wonderful. I have a church garden <coughs> at Crossroads in Big Fork that I had started. And it's amazing what happens when you work side to side in the garden with people with problems. And that whole idea of ministering to people. And you're able to just share like an, a comment here or there. Or, or you're working in the garden and somebody says something and you're like, ooh, don't know how to respond to that one. And then just, you know, a few minutes later or something, it's like, oh, have you tried this? And so you're really able to use gardening as a ministry, whatever your language in that ministry is. Um, Why can't they see this? Okay, there we go. Observe and interact. And, and you'll, I'll add on to these, so design principles. So the first thing you do anywhere you go is you observe. And you kind of like, it's one of those things where you, you just, it's like, I'm trying to teach my kids this all the time. Embrace the movement around you. Or it's it's about, what do they we call that? Um, something awareness. Spatial awareness. You know, just like when you walk in, observe what's going on. When you walk into a garden, observe what is working as well as what's not working. But really try to observe what is. Um, and then interact. Where can you, like when you come into a kitchen, over there when you go into the kitchen, you observe what's going on and where can you just jump right in. I remember my dad could always like catch the cup as it was falling mm -hmm. off the counter right next to you, you know. So observe and interact. So two, very important, catch and store energy. So we want to catch water. One of the best ways to catch water is in the mulch of the soil. So you taught me that one. And... So where can you catch the rainwater off your roofs and do your rainwater gardens, right, where you're catch, catching that? And then you want to really have lots of mulches because it's going to, again, water is stored in the mulch of the soil, the organic matter of the soil. If you don't have organic matter on or in your soil, you will not store water. It will dry up and you will have a clump of clay. Or if you have sand, it will just pass right through it. So catch and store energy, how can you start to have, you know, systems with batteries or whatever, you know, catch and store energy. You know, store up your gas, you know, if, you, if anybody wants to know, like, the best alternative energy system for backup energy, it's like this battery bank that you plug into your car and you have extra gas stored. It's like a $200 system. Um, Steven123.com is where you can find that information. So all these people that are without water in the flooded areas or if you have a big snowstorm, 
that's the best, cheapest, even maybe even better than a generator because generators are really expensive to buy. That's the best energy backup system. Like, especially here when you don't have sun, you can't do solar. Obtain a yield. You know, a lot of times in my garden, I dink around and I plant things that don't really produce a yield. But it's really important for me to propagate those raspberries. Or instead of buying all those perennial flowers, I love feeding the bees. You know, maybe I should be buying different varieties of, of berry bushes or something. So, so when you're planting your garden, plan to obtain a yield. And, and you're going to be thinking, obtain a yield, obtain a yield. Whatever you do... And, and because our time is so limited with everything, you want to be able to, to obtain a yield. What, what you want to, I know that we don't think of everything is with money, but really, whatever you do, like write down urban, profitable urban farming. Curtis Stone made an awesome book called Profitable Urban Farming. And you want to know how to have the best backyard garden that you don't spend a bunch of time weeding, because weeding does, is not a... It's, it's not a calculable investment into your yield. So the less time you spend weeding, the higher your yield. So, so his system is very cool. Um, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. And you know, a lot of times, a lot of us are we're so hypersensitive that we can't handle feedback. But it's really a, an important principle. So. A lot of things in permaculture, like they say it's not permaculture if it's not in the ground. We stick things in the ground and it gives you feedback as to, well, you know, you probably should have added these soil amendments with it to make its chances of survival a little bit higher. And hopefully we can get into soil amendments, but never forget horticultural molasses because it is the catalyst that will pop all of your bacteria. Do not forget your studies in biochar. You have to start playing with fire because biochar is amazing, and you'll get to a point where you will never let another burning piece of wood turn to ash. So, and I love it. Gloria Flores is here. She's my biochar guru. And if you go to pacificbiochar.org or com, I can't remember, um, it will show you videos on just how to make one, and, you, and, and here's a little tip, 55 degree slope. You, build, you dig a hole with 55 degree slope, and your, and your pile of wood is, is about two and a half by two and a half by two and a half feet, or basically ba about a meter. You get bigger than that, you send your eyebrows, you know, it gets really <laughs> big. You always top light a pile. Anytime anybody has a slash pile, never let them bottom light it, because that is one smoky mess. You get the bigger stuff on the bottom, and you work over to the smaller stuff. You always, forever and ever and ever, you always top light a fire. Because it burns down, it releases those volatile fuels and it takes it out of the wood and you don't burn the carbon you just burn the fuel out of it which is toxic to the ground anyway and then you crush up the biochar you stick it in with a bunch of water you put some chicken manure in it in this with water and you might inoculate it with a bunch of uh, mycorrhizal fungi that you order off of amazon.com or you go get it out of the forest or whatever but you inoculate that biochar with bacteria and fungi and it will be a thousand years of nutrition for your roots. And you want to get it really soupy and wet. So that's the quick and easy on biochar. So use and value renewable resources and services. Try to, you know, try to get into renewables. And I love that one because it really gives us a sense of getting away from, from fuels and stuff like that. So, you know, heating systems in your house, you know, you try to get back to renewable resources. Uh, you know, burning wood, I, you know, it's a renewable resource, and we see what happens when, when we actually don't cultivate our forests enough, if, you know, they end up burning up. So, use, uh, produce no waste, so try to get to the point where you're really composting all your stuff and recycling and not buying things that, you know. Design from patterns to details, so looking at the bigger pattern of what you want to see, and we're going to talk about zones and, and as you move out in the design concepts. So look at the larger patterns of nature, how things flow, how you flow through your neighborhoods and what your daily flow is. And so design your life from the larger patterns down to the details. Like if you have kids or you have family members, look at the bigger patterns in your relationships and then figure out where, where you can tweak a couple details to make things better. Um, and that's a, that's a um, you know, as you get along in your designing, you're going to, you're going to, look at that you're gonna it's gonna make more sense 
integrate rather than segregate. So people always say, okay, the orchard's over here, and the, you know, this is over, the annual garden's over here. So the more that you integrate things, you know, the, the fruit trees with the berry bushes, with the, there, there's a symbiotic relationship. Um, use small, slow, small solutions. And I try to teach this on a, on a community level because a lot of times these communities will adopt these tremendously huge expensive systems like a, for sewage or for you know like a huge dam instead of just making a lot of little micro dams everywhere and, and micro energy everywhere so so as much as you can a small solution if it fails is not a big problem so if you can have a lot of small solutions for your your issue your, your situation whatever it is and just every day you're doing these little small things instead of saying, okay, I'm going to make this big change, and then you either never do or it fails in your disaster. So sm slow, small solutions. Like um, in restoration agriculture, uh, Shepard uh, talks about it this way. He says, he says, you know, maybe I just use a solution where I just plant two or three new species every year, but after a while that, that changes, or I, I you know, decide to put this one, you know, manure everywhere or something, you know, it's like he just tries to do small things. It might be on a large scale, but it's just small changes. So use that in your life. Use it in the way you clean your house. Slow, small solutions. So all these design principles can go to any aspect of business or land or anything. Um, use and value diversity. You know, if we could just embrace that with each other, wouldn't that be nice? We could be teaching that as a permaculture principle, definitely on the social level. Uh, use edges and value the marginal. Um, they say that the, the greatest diversity and biodiversity happening is on the edge of a forest where it turns into a prairie. And so you'll see in your gardens, if in your systems you just start permaculturing, like planting stuff from the trees that exist, and start going out. So you don't have to go tear up all the lawn, but Start from the edges and value could you, that. Could you say that one, the phrase of that again? Yeah, uh, use edges and value the marginal. And the other thing too is you'll see in permaculture they'll do like a lot of designs that, that, that maybe a bed weaves in and out or, or they have arms that come off it. If you look at any of the permaculture bed options or designs, you increase edge. If you do like water gardens or something like that, the more you increase edge, the more you increase the biodiversity at that edge. So, so like the idea behind biochar is that within that little tiny space of biochar is a tremendous amount of edge because there's so many little tiny microscopic holes and where the fuel used to be, the volatile fluids used to be that burned off. And so that bacteria gets in there and so you want to be able to you know, a, a straight line never has as many species in it as a curved line. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, so um, creatively use and respond to change. So, you know, change is inevitable, so use it in your favor. You know, I, the changing of the seasons, you know, right now it's like, oh, well, I can't plant anything, but now I can start seeding new things for the fall to get up and going so that they grow under the snow, and so first thing in the spring they pop up. So. Every season has its own job and everything. So this is kind of a, you know, one of sort of like the typical little uh, dialogues that you'll see in, in how the ethics and principles and design strategies go into all aspects of from home community to bioregion. So it, you can take these principles into finance and economics, tools and technology, uh, the built environment, like, you know, your buildings and how you're going to situate everything. Um, land and nature stewardship, health and well-being, culture and education. So when you think about, well, what, you know, what kind of permaculture am I going to teach to the world or how am I going to share this with somebody, just see how you can start to have it in your life in those. So, so it, it's really diverse. You have a lot of options. I really tell people it's really the new paradigm to where we're going. It's really what we would have known if we would have been raised as earthlings instead of human cultures that are all divided and segregated. This is earthling knowledge. This is how you can actually do what you were designed and built to do as a steward of the land. You were actually built to steward all of creation. So, that's my opinion. Because we're smart and we have thumbs. <laughs>
<laughs> and we can learn about what other what other habitats were creators, were builders, and so we can build habitats for things to thrive. And then when when as many things thrive, and like like uh, Lawton says, the more diversity you have in your system, the more resilience. So just think about that. You are the you are the god of your backyard, and when you order that or goddess. And when you order all those mycorrhizae and stuff like that on Amazon, you are introducing species that will live there forever. I guess we goosebumps. Mm -hmm. And it'll just go out. And then, you know, that you bring in wood chips and you bring in plants and stuff like that. And you are creating a biodiversity that literally could live for 2,000 years. The only thing on planet Earth that we can do that has longevity is plant species. And if you want proof of that, there is another movie you must watch and it's called Message from the Heart of the World. It's another classic permaculture film. And it was uh, some unconquered tribes in the high plateaus of Colombia and they invited a BBC cameraman in and they, they talked about their, uh, their whole um, reality. It's really interesting how they raise a shaman. You're going to just go, oh my god. Um, but they had terraces that were already, when they found it from some other culture that was gone by the time they got there, they were already, the terraces had plants and medicinals in them already planted. And these terraces were 2,000 years old. So you know that your mark on the earth can last for 2,000 years old. That lasts longer than a book, right? So plant trees. So in permaculture, um, there's a big thing about sectors. And <laughs> I did this presentation in Panama, so I might have switched this thing to Mapa de Sectores. Anyway, so, so you're always going to see, like when I look at a piece of land and I'm designing it, the first thing you do is what crosses that land? Okay, how does the sun go in the summer? How does the sun go in the winter? Where does the noise come from? When I set my tent up last night, I wanted to figure out, I, I looked at the sectors, I'm like, where did the night light shine? And where is the noise coming from? And I want to put myself behind a tree so I don't have to have the noise or the light. Where are these people going to be talking because there's chairs sitting there? I want to be, you know, so you're always looking at sectors. What's crossing it? What kind of view does the neighbor have in? So where are you going to try to block the winds because you want to block the cold prevailing winds because the worst thing on your plants is desiccating wind that, that dries it and it freezes it. And, you know, I assume we're all in zone four or five, so... So, sun, wind, summer, winter, views, where do you have views, um, and where could you have fire, you know, where do your storms come from, you know, so you want to be able to block, use your trees, like, I want to buy this piece of barley field, and they're going to be spraying pesticides all around me, so where are the winds going to possibly put those pesticides in, and I want to have a really thick hedge of trees, and by the way, I have a, a, an automatic tree transplanter, so if anybody wants to like port it somewhere to their farm to drop in a thousand and four thousand trees a day, <laughs> contact me. Hmm. Yeah, one of these guys just used it. He's gonna bring it so that we huh. Okay, so zones. So zones are really cool, and you can think about your you know, your home is always zone zero, and there's a lot of uh, permaculture talks and videos on zone zero. Like, how to get your house designed so that you can bring food in from the garden, process it, dry it, can it, whatever, wash it, and everything. And so if you think about making a house or designing a house, you want to design it with, with the garden in mind. And they, they, they always say, you're always taking something out, like compost, out to the garden. I just throw it in some section of the garden. I let my bugs eat it. I, it keeps the bees somewhere else. And, um, and then you're always bringing something into the house. So you want to be able to design that. Zone one is your kitchen garden. Bill Mollison says that you don't want to have to get your slippers wet to get your chives for your eggs in the morning. <laughs> and so really think about patio gardening and container gardening because there's a lot you can do. And there's all these wonderful vertical gardening things. You can do plastic bottles that, you know, don't think that permaculture is always about soil. The great thing about permaculture is that, in my opinion, it's become this umbrella that every single good idea we adopt, we're, we, what is that word, like we, you know, we take it, we take it. So zone two is where you're going to have your things that you visit maybe weekly or monthly or seasonally. 
So, you know, put your squash that you're going to harvest at the end of the year out further. And then three might be the, you know, your orchard crops, the things that are you want out of your way so you're not hitting your head every time. I mean, how many times have I planted fruit trees and I'm always ducking so they don't get me? Um, four, your animals or your whatever, five. And then always remember zone five is the wild. Even in my 100 by 140 foot place, there's always the wild, the places that I almost never go. And uh, that's where I put the dog poop. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, um, you can look at in terms of your 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 life too. Like if you go between your house and the grocery store, cultivate that zone one, you know, or the bank or whatever in your neighborhood. You know, talk to those neighbors, invite them to a permaculture class. You know, just enhance your zone one or your zone two, the places where you travel all the time. That's your world. So design it. It's not only about mm -hmm. your backyard. Work it out into the community. Where do you travel every day and every week and try to see how you can make it better. And one of these guys that was in a podcast said the most important thing you can do is get on your local planning board, your parks board, everything. Because just like Kareem said, we need a voice of intelligent design working with the way that we, you know, build and make laws and make changes and they're always looking for good ideas so please become part of your local governing bodies you know you have to sign up for going every Monday night once a week to this meeting or Wednesday night to that meeting but you will make such a difference and it will make your self-esteem feel better because you're actually contributing in a way that affects the future of that community and as your catalyst the children of that community and the families of that community have more to do. We live on a reservation is the highest suicide rate in the entire country. They say, while well, Montana is a beautiful place to visit in the summer, you do not want to live there in the winter on a reservation because you will probably kill yourself. And I know that it's really bad here because there's no sunshine. And you have to get outside. You have to do things. It's a great time for classes and activities. So get out there and create cool stuff that teaches intelligent design because we need a new paradigm to function from, because our old paradigm to function from, is lacking vast bodies of information. So here's what I was talking about with edge. These are called keyhole gardens. So, you, so along your path, do keyhole gardens. That's, that's, that's really making edge here, because all your smaller plants are in front, and you graduate to your taller plants in the back, or the plants that are uh, you know, zone two or three are in the back, and zone one is right next to your path. So it doesn't have to be like that, it could be just where you can reach it. So these are big keyhole gardens, uh, food forest, raised beds. I love raised beds, and that's where you get into the whole study of human culture. Because to me, uh, for what I've done to my back, I would rather not bend over very much. And I get to the point where it's like, I just don't want to bend over at all. Um, any of you have taken a design course or intend to or want to or know what it is? Okay, do you guys know what's in the design course? Basically, they teach you what's in the manual. So if you want to go on the podcast called Permaculture Voices, they did a conference, and I believe it was in Permaculture Voices PV1 is the Permaculture Voices conference. So PV1 and then look up um, Jeff Lawton, G-E-O-F-F -F, Lawton, and he does a talk that is exactly what is taught in the permaculture design course. It is a one and a half hour, tremendously packed thing. It's a 72 hour course, and you probably come out of it with a plethora of ideas and imagination and way more questions than when you went in. And then you begin your search for practical how-to knowledge. And uh, Jerome here was my first teacher in 98, and then Skeeter, I did another one with him. So it's really neat. Um, okay, so up here in the corner is Chinapas. I was telling you, like, water farming. And to me, that is so exciting. And if you have any sources of water to be able to create little ponds and do aquaculture with different fish or just growing algae because it's the best thing to put on your beds. And um, what they do is they have, uh, uh, the Bullocks had flooded a whole agricultural area that used to be marsh and they drained it for agriculture. Well, he, they reflooded it and it, so it wasn't very much water, but they would 
put in these big straw bale islands and then everybody was getting muck and putting it on the beds and then planting the beds with things, not only trees that like water or willows to hold it eventually, but they would they would plant it with all the greens and the foods that they didn't want the deer to get. So it's a really good deer strategy. So sometimes when you're looking for a piece of land and it's full of, of wetlands, you know, think about if, if it's not got a wetland protection, but it's just marshy and, you know, like Sepp Holzer says, you could never have a land with too much water. So in the dry season, you could get a machine out there and dredge areas so that you have a natural chinopus situation. And then you can, when it floods in the spring again, you plant your chinopus and then when it goes down, then you've got your stuff already ready to harvest by the time that anything you get at it. So I've been looking at wetlands because there's a lot better, like cheaper land that you can get that are marshy because nobody wants to build on them, but maybe they've got a little corner you can build on and the rest could turn into the most amazing permaculture system. So Chinampas, C-H-I-N-A-M-P-A-S. Google it and look at the satellite imagery over Bolivia, how in ancient times they did Chinampas all over. You can see it from satellite. So it's so exciting. I love it. So that's getting into the water, pigs, greenhouses, the cob, so uh, multifunctional systems. And you know, you can do this on a small scale. You can, you can do rabbits in a backyard if you're in the city. So this is like saying, this is showing how you, you do things that are at different levels and, and you create taller levels that will break the wind. And, there's no such thing as a plant that really truly needs full sun. So all plants like some shade more than we think they might need or want. And so having your, you know, your systems diversified with that, the, you know, they've got the, the wavy rows there because they've shown how you get more plants into a wavy one than, than not. So, how many of you are in a city versus rural? I mean, the kind of city. Like, I mean, like, do you live on a lot in town, or do you live, uh, do you have acreage? How many of you have acreage? Okay, cool. Lots of plan in there. Well, you know, even on, I have a double lot, and it's, it's more than I can get to know. So, there's a lot you can do with it. Um, there's a ton of stuff on vertical growing that's very exciting. So if I have a small space, I would really look into vertical growing. And then how can we get into really cool co-housing situations where you plan a development and there's a central thing that meets the needs, like a central shop and a central kitchen. And, and then all the houses around it have very small kitchens where they do some meals, but you get everybody to do a, a center meal. So co-housing is another really cool study. There's a whole book on it. Jeff Lawton does a lot of videos. If you guys haven't seen Jeff, Jeff Lawton's videos, it's just at jefflawton.com, G-E-O-F-F. -F. Um, please watch all of his videos. They're really amazingly done. He does one on communities. Um, so, so one of the things that we talk about a lot in permaculture is stacking functions. So you want a tree or a bush or a plant that does more than one thing. Like, let's take comfrey. Somebody came up to me and she said, oh, I've been to, oh, it was you. <laughs> it's like, when you taught me about comfrey, and I said, oh, I teach everybody about comfrey. So comfrey is known as one of the top three plants in permaculture. And, um, and I plant it around all the base of my fruit, my fruit trees. And I, it's also a very good edge plant. So it'll keep the grasses from growing into your garden. You can cut it with a serrated sickle very quickly and easily three harvests a year. The leaves can be used for manure tea, and you can look up online exactly. One time I let my manure tea go for about a month, and it was very nasty. And studying with uh, Elaine Ingham, with the, the soil scientists, if you ever can take it as a, a Dr. Elaine Ingham class or watch her videos, you'll learn more about how to feed your soil and your soil web of life, and, and letting your compost tea go for a month would probably be brewing some pretty nasty looking creatures. So, mm -hmm. so I don't recommend it, especially showing it up at a park board meeting after you've just gotten rid of it all over the grass or the lawn or something and, and then come in smelling like it. So I think it's like a 24 hour thing. <laughs> and ideally, if you 
like, you're like, you're like <laughs> brewing it with bubbles and you know, and so there's this whole thing about how to make compost tea without creating bad things. Really what's your yeah. favorite place to get? Do you start from seed or do you get starts or what's your favorite place for Well, I do both. Um, I do a lot of direct seeding. Um, I have never been really on top of doing starts because I've been raising these little things called babies. And so, and, and, and I have a, and you know what my problem is? I clean house too much. I'm a housekeeper more than I'm even anything. Everybody gives me a hard time about doing so much permaculture. Mom, why are you always doing permaculture? I'm like, I'm not. I'm always doing the dishes or I'm always mm -hmm. doing laundry. It's like, I don't even get to my permaculture. So, so I always swear that I'm going to make a proper greenhouse and then it's going to, so there is a greenhouse course taught by Rob Avis of uh, permaculture up in Edmondson area in Canada. And it's, um, it's, if you look up Rob Avis, uh, you, it's all about how to do, and, and Curtis Stone also has some really cool greenhouse ideas where they're they're taking the the air out of the ground and putting it up, and taking the hot air, putting it in the ground, warming the ground, and so there's this battery, earth battery, and so in these northern climates, we need to know how to do greenhouses that don't freeze everything when it drops too many degrees, and you know, but yet not spend a bunch of money in fuel. So uh, passive. Passive solar greenhouses are really good to do. And I've never really had a good greenhouse set up. And I just, I haven't been on, on top of it enough to do season extenders. I don't know. I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't come out of winter very on top of things. So, I, and I found I did get tested with vitamin D. And you're supposed to be between 80 and 100. And I was 20. So Ooh, you guys take yeah. your vitamin D. Because even when you're out in the garden, it doesn't make it through winter. And they say that nobody up here in the northern climates gets it because the rays are slanted. So everybody take vitamin D so you don't like feel like you're dying and Grey's Anatomy is the only thing that makes you happy in life. That's <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so so you look at I'm sorry, okay, so stacking functions. So so Comfrey is is doing all those things. It's a mulch producer. It is a and we will go through this. Um, it's a deep um, I wonder if I have a slide on this. So, so a plant can either be a mulch producer, a nitrogen fixer, a deep nutrient accumulator. That's why I love bindweed now, because the root goes way down and it mines all these minerals and it brings them up and deposits them on the surface. And if you harvest it before it goes to seed, then it is a wonderful mulch plant, hence the serrated sickle. Um, the other thing is with comfrey, it is a wonderful deep nutrient accumulator. It pulls stuff up. So you want to make sure that in your guild, and we'll talk about guilds here, like this one here that says the forest garden, seven levels of beneficial guild. So I'm just going to skip around a second here. So in a guild, and it shows like that, but you can have it in a circle. You want to make sure not to put your plants too tightly so you can't get through your raspberries to harvest your apples. But you can put comfrey at the base of all your trees because as the root trees go out, the comfrey goes down and it mines calcium and magnesium for your roots. And then it deposits all that too on the surfaces of a for mulch plant. Mint is another wonderful thing to grow at the bottom of trees because it has a very intense symbiotic mycorrhizal uh, relationship with tree roots. What so is that? mint, all the mint families. They're really good for growing under trees, and, it, and they'll keep the grasses out too. Did you put your comfrey in the fall or the spring? Any time of year. In fact, I've got it right as it's freezing in the ground and shipped it to Florida, and they put it in the ground. And oh, by the way, five roots for twenty bucks. So what I do is I get those little easy to ship like FedEx boxes that doesn't matter how much they weigh. And I tell people, okay, it's going to cost this much for shipping, whatever size box they want. And then I'll double it or triple it for how much comfrey I stick in there. Because I'm giving them a slamming deal. In fact, I'm giving them the whole comfrey that they need for their farm. So comfrey, and especially if you have a sandy area or something like that, that's just always, I mean, that stuff thrives in sand. Even if you don't water it, because that's my church garden is like completely abandoned and, and it's just still thriving. Okay, so... In the, in the guild layers, you want your overstory plant, you want your lower tree layer, your, your, so you might have like in the back of your field, you might have like a nut tree, then a standard fruit tree, then a dwarf fruit tree, berry bushes so that you go down 
um, to you know a bushy layer, herbaceous layer. Um, then you go to your your perennial herbs like comfrey, and then you go to your annuals, and then you go down to your root plants and your fungi, and then you do like the creepy crawly things, that, the vines. So those are like the seven layers of plants. So like when you're looking at any element in your system in order to see <coughs> functions, you look at like the chicken. So you look at what are the needs of the chicken, so what are the inputs, what do they need, uh, and then what are their products and characteristics. You're going to have to give a chicken places to scratch and to roll and to dust and it needs to nest and all that. And then what, uh, what are its, um, so products and behaviors and intrinsic characteristics. And so you can do this with everything, you know, what does a tree give you, you know, what does it need, what, is it, what does it want. So you have to look at everything in your system as to what it does. And once you kind of know these things, you're like, oh, well, if I put the chickens or the pigs here, the pigs are going to root. And so, like, Joel Salatin, if you see this movie tonight, Polyfaces, he has a leader follower system. So he has the grazers first, and then he has the browsers if they need to, and then they have the grazers, and then they have the rooters and the scratchers and the diggers. And so they'll go through and they'll eat the bugs out of the poop, but they'll kind of till in all this stuff and then they leave it. They leave it alone until like next year or three months from now or whatever. And then the whole thing just comes to life. Alan Savory with Holistic Management. Another huge, great TED Talk, Alan Savory and Holistic Management. If you guys can just study Holistic Management, it will get your brain going into what's important, how to prioritize, what can you change versus what you can't change. So holistic, the holistic, um, management thing, they have something called the scale of permanence, which we'll talk later. But um, Alan Savory has a great quote that says, you can only fix the soil through the gut of an animal, because they have the bacteria that the, that the soil needs to come back to life. So somehow you've got to get poop into your system, or you know, a lot of, a lot of compost material, or the poop from bacteria, or the poop, you know, so pick your poop, but you got to feed it. So that's why the horticultural molasses is really important to make all your active, your bacteria and everything become active because it's the exudates, the poop and the dead bodies that feed the, that feed the roots, not the mineral that you give the plant. It's how the bacteria breaks down that mineral, lives and dies, that feeds the root. Mm -hmm. And yeah, minerals. Minerals are another one. So in permaculture, we want it in stacking functions. You know, we want to capture the rainwater so that we can feed the chickens, and then that goes, and we feed something else, and then that falls. And so you just want to keep thinking, how can you stack functions? How can you create shade? You know, I just think that the most important thing that we can do in this world is start creating shade. So look in terms of your designing is, you know, where do you want little patches of sun? Where are you going to walk? Because you want all your walkways shaded. So plant those trees now because 16 years from now you're going to appreciate that there's shade. What trees can you plant that grow really fast? Shade. And, and elderberry is a really good fast grower that will shade. And it's a, it's a mid-story layer. So, um, and ground, ground like strawberries and ground cover, those are really important too. That's another reason why I like bindweed. It's a ground cover. So... It was only when I got that serrated sickle and it was easier to manage because even pulling it would hurt me. After a while, I do massage and so after a while, I can't use my thumbs or my wrists too much for many things other than what I already have to do. So here's our chicken thing. So, so when you see, like, what are all the products? Like, what can you create from whatever you have in your system? You, you're going to find that in your permaculture mindset, you're going to start being attracted to certain things. Like, like I, didn't, I can't eat chicken eggs, but I can eat duck eggs. So I'm always thinking, well, how could I have a duck farm? And there's a lot of great YouTubers out there on, on their ducks. So like how to raise ducks instead of chickens, which is a great niche market. Um, you know, what do they need and what are their characteristics? So do you kind of have the ice concept? Um, there is a... Guy named uh, Martin, I can't say his last name, but he's got opensourceecology.com. Uh, he's coming up with a bunch of different engineered equipment that you can either buy or learn how to make, and everything's open source. And so, for example, they have a brick press 
that you could make it for $3,000 or buy it from them for $10,000 shipped, and it will press bricks into houses from the dirt right below your feet. So, um, and they have all these kind of interchangeable machines and batteries and stuff, or not batteries, but like, the, you know, the, the engine or the machine parts. They can go from one tool to another, and he has like 50 tools to hold, to completely create a sustainable community. So Martin, no, anyway, suppose, yeah, I don't know, no, I'm getting mixed up with other, other people. There's so many great people in this permaculture world of these sustainable systems. Okay, so uh, vertical growing, don't forget about aquaponics, and Jack Spierko on the Survival Podcast has an awesome podcast on different versions of aquaponics just for your backyard systems. And he's like, I love agroforestry, but I do not like soil farming. So he's always planting his trees and his bushes and his systems for agroforestry, but for annuals, which I don't like them either because they take too much attention and too much water and everything, and I'm never good at growing annuals. I will say that I'm a perennial person. Because my annuals, I buy them from the store when I don't get my starts going. Uh, and my things, my seeds I didn't water. And they're like one or two came up. Because I, I love building. I don't like maintaining. So I want to get into, and like you can go down to Murdoch's or one of these farm stores. And you buy these big uh, Rubbermaid totes. These big, big, you know, watering tanks that are made out of Rubbermaid. And, you know, he tells you how like the whole system and different kinds of like, you know, systems that you can do with biochar as the medium or, you know, coconut holes or whatever. And so different forms of aquaponics. There's another guy that I studied with uh, called Friendly Aquaponics. All of his information is in his newsletter. So, I mean, I hate to, like, really overwhelm you guys, but there's so many exciting things to look forward to. That's why I love how she talks about that permaculture gives hope to people. Because it gives us a new, like, it's like, oh, what do you want to study in college? Mm. I don't know. I mean, because we have like what a handful, a couple handfuls of venues that already don't pay because the market's saturated or whatever. It's or it's outdated market. So, getting into all this kind of stuff, this is the cutting edge where colleges are now catching up to what the permaculture world has been studying for thirty years. So, luckily, my daughter is in one of the colleges that is now got, it, and she said that. They're one of like four colleges now that has an agroecology program with bioengineering. She goes, Mom, the whole bioenergy program is like one class. <laughs> I was like, I know, right? You really should look at my library. <laughs> I should look at my library. So if you haven't heard about Rocket Mass Heaters, uh, Paul Eaton and um, the, the folks out there at Permis have uh, yeah, there's a great new book out on it, Rocket Mass Heaters, uh, by Erica and Ernie Weisner, Weisner, Weisner. And they always come out here to Permis, Paul Wheaton's place, and they teach on how to create this. Um, the quick thumbnail sketch is you, you put the sticks in here vertically. Uh, it sucks in this tube. It goes up. This is a 50-gallon drum. There's only about uh, two to three inches right here. And... Because this is hot, and then this, it, then the, it, the exhaust comes out here, and this is colder, it creates a rocket, a suction, and, um, and then the exhaust comes out here, and because this is so hot, it burns the smoke, and so there's no, so it comes out here at about 90 degrees with no smoke, except for maybe when you're just getting it going, but once it's going, and then there's a, a mass all around it of cob or of rocks and bricks and everything like that. And this heats up, so for about three hours, this stays nice and warm giving off, and then you're only burning these little sticks. And so people actually save about 80% of their fuel burning needs. And you're able to put this under a bed or, you know, something to sit on or something like that. So in the wintertime, you know, when you're, you're cold, your kidneys can be warm. This is a John Payne, uh, P-A-I-N, or an E, I'm not sure, um, where they, they do tubes and tubes of black water pipe through here, and it's a compost pile of manure and wood chips, and it heats up to compost temperature, and it's heating your water. So Paul has a video on how to have 500 hot water showers, and I, I really thought that would really be cool you know, during your summer Airbnb people that they have their showers actually heated by 
a composting pile. And then in Paul's place, they have um, they have uh, their bathroom and their urinals. They'll have a, a urine diverter that goes into those piles that can heat. It. And then they have all the guys. They have like this balcony thing, and all the guys pee off the balcony <laughs> down onto the compost pile. So, so that's a way to heat the speed up. You know, because pee is like the second highest nutri uh, nitrogen after chicken manure, or it's the next higher. So, so save your pee, and it's really important to get into who wanted to know more about the poop, the human manure. It's totally great, and I know a guy that has lived for 30 years in his place over in the Swan. I can't believe he's not here because it's totally on fire over there, and he should come over. But, um, but Brian Parks, he he showed me his little four by four things out in the woods where he has always, for all these years, been just putting his his five gallon poop composting thing, and it's all composted. So um, there's a really cool invention that that Jerome had a guy out at his place called uh, it's called the Sunny John. And it was a way to heat up the lower chamber of where the 50 gallon tanks were. And so by the time, and the whole PDC used this one toilet and it didn't stink. And so you'd poop in this 55 gallon drum and when it was full, you'd move it over into this lower chamber down below the poop part, the bathroom part. And then when, it, when that was full, the other one was already fully composted and they just throw worms in. And the trick is you just do wood shavings. You just do just you just cover your poop with wood shavings, and then like I said, once in a while you can throw in some worms or some you know some like mycorrhizae or some sort of an inoculant, and it just composts. And uh, they had it so that in front of the window where the bathroom was, there was a black pipe, uh, and it, so the pipe would heat up. There's a little squirrel cage fan, and it would blow that hot air down onto the chamber down below. And it was vented out down below, so it was always hotter down below where those 50 gallon drums were sitting. But I never smelled anything coming out of those. And it's important to divert the urine because that's where you get the stinky, wet, non composting stuff, and, and you just cover the other stuff with wood shavings. And so, so at Paul's, too, they just have a little thing of wood shaving. And where they sit on the toilet, because girls, you know, kind of pee forward, it just automatically goes into this little net screen thing and then just goes on around and then goes into the composting thing so 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 there you go there's your human error <laughs> i actually helped build one of these these tanks a 55,000 gallon tank at willix farms and we we did it all and, and it was a ferrous cement and it was a really cool um uh like my ex-husband and I, we wired the whole thing, and then everybody, they had this big, huge party, and the money from doing the Chinopus workshop helped them finally make this 55,000 gallon tank that they were wanting for all these years because they would take solar panels and pump it to the top of the hill and then gravity feed all their plants all the way down. And they had, they had microclimates, so they were growing crazy things like yucca in you know, a very cold climate right there on the ocean. And you know, somebody get on the inside of the cement or the tank and the outside of the tank and you just go up together. It was really cool. I helped build the cob oven there and so somebody, I said, oh yeah, I helped build that. And they said, so why did it crack? I said, well, why would one crack? And they said, well, you're supposed to let it wait like a month or two to dry and cure before you use it. I said, no, we used it like the day after it was done, you know. We are baking bread in it. And so, anyway, you learn a lot along the path and, and you learn by doing. You know, and you learn by running into other people telling you what works and what doesn't. So getting into rainwater harvesting, I did an orchard for my sister, big thing, and every tree I put a little boomerang around it so it would capture anything that was going to run off. So go right into that tree. So ponds, the boomerangs, and each boomerang would flow down to another one. This is in... Um, uh, those books on rainwater harvesting and gray water harvesting are really, or gray water systems are really two key library resource books that you want. Um, rainwater harvesting, okay. I think that's Art Lovely, or it, and it, I get them mixed up, and then the gray water, the gray water book. So if you want, you know, it's really ideal that you can put your showers and everything into gray water systems. Showers and laundry is really easy. And there'll be like sand tanks that you can do, or a old bathtub full of sand, and you run it through a biofilter of sand. Um, swales, you get the idea of, of runoff, and you know, you plant your trees on the on the downside of the swale, and you know. So those are really expensive, and you have to do 
sort of like a, really an assessment to see if you can afford to do a swale and if it's really going to give you the payoff that you want. But part of the Australian system is to do a lot of swales. Um, Darren Doherty believes that you should, you know, plant your trees on a key line design. That's another whole body of information is key line design. So just write that down and um, look it up and you'll find some videos and audios on key line design. And that's really how to capture water, um, kind of like on contour, but slightly off contour. So it's, it's a way to set up your, your systems. And it's really important as well. Uh, aspect of permaculture. So this is stacking functions, putting your chicken horse or a swale so you don't have the runoff of the manure going down. You actually are able to capture it and then you, you, know, you dig it out and you put it on your trees when it's composted. Um, removing silt. This is for areas that get a lot of rainwater. That's the chinampas, different forms. When I lived in Panama, boy, it rained and you just, you just watch it running down. So different Different earthworks, again, very expensive, but if you've got the use of some backhoe, sometimes you have to calculate if it's a good investment. Like, I like uh, Gabe Gull's shirt, it says, everything depends, it all depends, and it's, that's, the, that's the permaculture thing. Oh, I just want to show you um, time stacking. So, you know, you grow, you plant things so that they grow up, and they might, you might plant, like some people, Jeff sometimes says you could plant like 20 nitrogen fixing trees per every fruit producing or nut producing tree. And then over time, when they start needing more space and light, you cut down the nitrogen fixing trees because they've done their job. So it's so time stacking. You plant something now that might give its life to what's coming up behind it. So time stacking. You know, I was, I was wondering too, is there like a certain ratio of like, non-nitrogen fixing plants to nitrogen fixing plants? To... I just have heard like the more nitrogen fixing plants you can get the better. Okay. You know, they really, the trees pull the nitrogen literally out of the air and, and bring it into the soil. So, so just looking at this year one, year three, year ten, start thinking that, you know, you might think that what you're doing this year is insignificant by planting a bunch of little bare root trees, but it's going to turn into that. And I have a 16 year old system that is beautiful, and I every year I plant a tree, so it's still growing bigger and bigger, but I'm just amazed at what has grown that I planted as a wisp. In fact, I have this one section, if you come and board my yard and I show people, you know how you heal in trees that you can't get to that are bare root, you know what healing in means? You dig a trench and you stick all your little bare root trees in there and you cover them so that by the time you properly prepare your holes and everything like that, then you can pull them out and you can do it because when you get bare root, you have to plant them within like 72 hours. And usually you cannot stop shopping when you go to a nursery and you're like, oh, I need five. Oh, oh, oh. And you come home with 200 plants. Well, you can't plant them all in 72 hours. So you heal them in. Well, I, there, were, there were like two American plums and Austria. Could you explain that a little bit more? You just build up with wood. Sometimes I'll even take rotted wood that I won't burn and I'll just start building up. And people do it with logs. You know, in the forest you can get all of like your rotting wood and build it up mm -hmm. and the, the more you build it up the longer it's going to live and be a productive bed it's really built for perennial systems um, annual systems is a little bit hard to to harvest it sometimes but like i said you know you want to integrate rather than segregate so you want to you know throw in your annuals too because the you never pull a root of a dead plant out unless it's an invasive root like a grass or something that you don't want in there because the dying root is going to feed the bacteria of the soil. So again, you need that serrated sickle that when you're getting rid of all of your weeds or your whatever, you're just cutting off the tops. If they haven't produced seed, you do the chop and drop. So you just lay it all down and it, you're constantly adding. Permaculture is you're not digging down, you're just constantly adding to the system. Whatever you find, be careful not to buy straw bales that have persistent herbicides in them because they will deter anything that you you know, plant, because it's a seven-year uh, pesticide that you use in there. Oh, this was the one I used in Panama, because I've got all the, all the types of species that you can have in your food forest that are their plants. Sorry, and then after you've made that bed, what, the next year you plant? Oh, plant. you know what I do is I, after I have my food, like I keep moving up smaller and smaller, like grass and leaves and stuff like that. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll either pot soil in it and then pot my plants in it, like my little starts, or I'll, I'll do, I'll 
cover it in soil. If you don't like the look of it being a compost pile, you can put a bunch of peat moss on it and just cover it. Um, every layer that you do, you want to get it really wet. It's like lasagna gardening, that's the key. It gets it going. Throw in that horticultural molasses or get some of your spent fruit in there because it's going to feed that bacteria of the soil. It's going to get the process of decomposition going. You need sugars. So anything that's going to feed your compost pile sugars. Spent food, spent fruit, horticultural molasses, and I don't really know what else. Um, Okay, so recycling waste, so, um, and then if you don't want any plants coming up from the bottom, like I start it on cardboard, make sure it's not from China because it's full of formaldehyde and it will not decompose, I have proof of that in one of my gardens. Um, or newspapers, don't use glossy, but start that so it, it, it real wet, everything really wet underneath and above because everything underneath that's native will rot. And then so you start adding and then you only have what you have in there. And even if you use like straw or hay, you know, be very careful not to use moldy straw or moldy hay and breathe it in because it could very much, mold poisoning is terrible, but it could give you bronchitis. I've, I've been through it all and, and be very, and never live in a house with black mold. If, if a house is musty, get the hell out because it will be killing you and it will be making you crazy and destroying your gut and everything. And I went through three years of severe illness of one of my kids because of black mold poisoning in a bathroom. Because I gutted the bathroom and then just anyway. Um, yeah, so try to get your water, your systems, recycle all your waste. Um, I, I last winter I posted on Facebook a picture of me stacking like four layers of bagged leaves against my house to keep my floors warmed, and my caption was the white trash wall of freedom from the cold. <laughs> I'm building my white trash wall of freedom. It was like right after the election, the whole wall, building the wall thing. So. And then, and then in the spring, I was able to take all those leaves and then put them wherever I didn't want grass to grow. So, because I don't want to deal with grass in my trees. So I always add, every year I add, I, I go and I, um, I, I grab all the leaves that people bag in the neighborhood. I put them on my beds and in the spring. I get free wood chips or we have the beehive company. Now you can get a dump truck load for $10. And I just put wood shavings or wood chips on top of the leaves. So it feeds the worms. And my soil used to be so compacted and full of clay. And now you can just literally reach down in and grab it. It's like all those little balls. And it stays moist and it thrives on neglect. So hopefully you guys can, on your way out, you know, Monday or whatever, come see my garden in Polson. It's a 16-year system. It's a beautiful thing for city, city farming. Um, this is the idea of the lasagna bed gardening. So you can Google that, and it's always that picture there, and you know the scraps and how you're feeding the web of life. Um, this is a little bit of what I'll be talking about on Sunday. Um, there's so many great talks. I, I hate to, you know like offering two talks, but I just like oh I just love the one I'm building. And we built our first straw bale house because somebody came to our town in Moab, Utah, and taught a class on straw bale building, and we were able to like you know, leave our house and rent it out and not have a mortgage because we built our own house. It's like having your own baby at home. Like, you go through this paradigm shift. It's like, what? I'm legally allowed to not have to go to the hospital or I'm legally allowed to build my own home? And these are, you know, how we've done it forever. So it really connects you with something very ancient and ancestral about yourself. And again, it's about getting back into what does it mean to be an earthling? And I believe being an earthling Part of what we did was build houses. And in Mexico, or in traditional Latina societies, the, the builders, the, the one who does the finish coat is the woman. And she's called the encaradora, and that means the one who puts the, the clay jar layer on it. And um, if you look up a website called Natural Plasters, they have a video on all the different kinds of ways you can do natural plasters. But there's cob, there's round earth. This, this peaked thing here is a, a straw bale, and there was a guy that his whole life is spent going around places like Mongolia and back roads, whatever, and teaching that this is the best, easiest way to do a straw bale. And, you know, cheapest, best insulation, everything. So it's the arc, the straw bale arc. Um, there's a new one out. Check out the video on Aircrete Domes. Aircrete Domes because that's mixing soap foam and concrete and you are able to make domes. And I, that's kind of neat. There's, um, 
bags like the potatoes come in that you do you know sort of round earth with you fill them with the soil right underneath and that's called hyper adobe or earth bag but the hyper adobe is these just these mesh bags so you don't need four prong barbed wire stuff like that i'm giving you my whole class in two minutes and um like burlap bags Burlap, yeah, their burlap is a little bit more expensive than the white poly bags, but even cheaper if you go to Canada Bag Company. Canada Bag Company. Um, they sell the bags that sweet potatoes come in, and it's in a whole roll, and you can get like a thousand feet for like $450, like a big roll of it. And you can build a whole, like, I can't remember what they said, like a 800 or 1200 square foot home you know, on a, a thousand feet of this roll of this stuff. And so, and all you do is you fill it with dirt and you tamp it. And you just keep going in, you get like a center pivot point and it just goes up, this arm goes up and it just tells you exactly where the next one is. And you pivot and you just tamp it and you can do archways and connect a dome, you know. And then I thought, well, what if you cover it with some sort of a, a pond liner or something and then, and then backfill it with like wood shavings or wood chips or something and have that composting action heat it in the winter time and then use those in the garden when it's done composting. So, I mean, there's all these great ideas and, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. So, I have about five minutes, so I'm just going to run, well, how did I get through here? There? Okay. Okay, so this is earth bag down here and a lot of bamboo, um, cob. Uh, round dirt, um, straw bale. So it's just, I think it's just really cool and funky. And okay, so these are some people that are doing a lot of training in this. Is that scale of permanence? We don't need to go into there. Darren Doherty does key line design and agrarians platform. That's if you really want to get into large farm scale. There's a place called Versaland. Dot com and it's out in Iowa and it's Grant Schultz. He teaches an awesome course if you have acreage and you want to do large land sale or going to into large land scale far, farm scale permaculture training, um, marketing, how to run your animals through electric fencing, how to get all your trees planted, what spacing, uh, when you plant between them, how do you mulch them with you know machinery and stuff like that. So it's farm scale permaculture and it's very exciting and Grant is such a good teacher. And he brings in such great people. So I did that training, and I, I keep trying to figure out how to get back there. The key line, uh, key line design uses the key line plow, so it rips like a furrow, and you drop a seed in it, and it, and then the next year you go next to it and rip a furrow, and so it breaks up the hard pad of the soil so that the moisture can infiltrate. And it's something that you want to do maybe before you plant your trees or you rip a key line. Like they show there all those lines that were ripped, and that's a key line plow right there ripping it. So it doesn't disturb the top of the soil, but it allows the water to infiltrate and the air to infiltrate. And they'll they'll plant their trees right on a key line rip. And then so the, there's like a lot of trainings to figure out how to find the key line on your property. And where would the key point be if you had the water when you go from concave to convex? Where, the, where it slows is where you want to do a pond and capture your rainwater or something like that. So that's a whole other part of large landscape stuff. Marketing energy soils. Um, paddock shift system with all kinds of animals. If you come to the movie tonight, uh, Polly Faces. And if you ever get a chance to see it, please do. It's a beautiful, beautiful film. Really well done. They spent their whole life savings making it. And um, she's won some awards at a lot of different fairs for it and everything. So, so this is, a, you know, there's a lot with that holistic management and Ellen Savory and the whole, you can actually become a center for holistic management for your area and start teaching holistic management as a way for people to learn plant grazing. It, you know, we take areas where grazing is popular and now they get to do things like um, soil reclamation and they get like earth stewardship awards and stuff like that if they do plant grazing because their soils improve year after year. So but remember, you can improve, you can, and, and then Joel Salatin teaches a lot about instead of having these big expensive systems, um, how can young farmers get into pieces that are leased land? And so you want to invest in transportable systems. So this is a transportable milking barn. You take the milker to the cows. 
so that they're not bothered really and they love it and um, you know portable chicken systems portable everything portable shade structures so you get everything so that you're so because because everybody's starting to find out that 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 pasture raised meat is the healthiest for you and this is the healthiest for the land and you can use animals to actually you know go in a leader follower system to do for the land what it needs in complete composting. Um, so this gets into the financial permaculture and stuff like that. There, there are classes taught on it on the, long, on, web, on the web, on YouTube, video, how to like really start to link up in your area different systems of, of you know, this person needs to put his stuff there and that person can link with that. And you create networking systems for businesses for your area, like you really get a partnership of people together, making a uh, collaboration. Um, so linking farmers, like people that are really trying to build local food systems, it's actually a college class now because it's so intricate. So how to, how to link farmers, entrepreneurs, processors, landowners, foundations, investors, science, research, consumers, and get them all going for a common good, which is like the farm to school, farm to hospital, you know, kind of thing. And there are so many foundations out there that are ready to give you money, you just have to come up with a good plan that they can. Um, like I said, I, I kind of changed this a little bit for Latin America. I thought I had my old presentation, but... Um, Paradise Lot is how they transformed this lot from this to this and what species they included. So that's a really neat book for urban stuff. Uh, the Permaculture DVD series, uh, but really you could just, you could just uh, watch Jeff Lawton's stuff online. Um, the guy that wrote Perma uh, Paradise Lot like, mm -hmm. also co-authored a book called Edible Food Forests that's awesome. Like literally every sentence that I've read in that book. So oh yeah, like, people say that blood. that is their Bible, volume one and two. Yeah. And he just came out with a new book that every college should be teaching and it's all on carbon farming. Cool. So it's all the plants you need for carbon requesting. Requestation. Um, and then everybody write down the permaculture school because they, he just came out with this whole new study plan and, and website uh, app or something for how to ask the difficult questions about what exact type of soil you have and that you're working with and then how to do your, your permaculture map. When you learn how to do a design consultation for somebody, you have to draw with crayons and markers or whatever, or you do CAD, or you do um, you know, some of these programs for design work. Um, I can't remember the typical one on Google they use, but anyway, uh, through the Permaculture School, he has a class, like a $99 class, and you get access, to, I think, to this app, this, this program that helps creating a design for someone a lot quicker and easier. Because people, that you spend so many hours on creating a design plan for someone, and you ask anyone, and it's like a big deal. So yeah, what is that called again? the the permaculture school. Okay. Yeah, go to him. He does a ton of videos. He's like the air guitar guy. <laughs> he's like the super Christian, long-haired hippie that really talks about. And he's like a really cool guy from Houston, but he's really working on getting um, permaculture more accessible for designers and consultants to be able to design and consult, so he's making it a lot easier. So, which is really a step we need to make, because that's where I get hooked up, is like, I don't want to turn on the computer and try to make a design for someone. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's like, and if I draw it, they're not going to think it's very good. And, and, you know. I have lots of those dialogues I need to work with myself a little bit. So if you look, um, uh, Green in the Desert is a good one, and um, Green Gold, movie uh, is amazing. Like if you just, if you look at where this place started out in China, the Los Plateau, and this is John Deleu's movie, and he's always doing amazing projects. He's doing a project in Jordan. He always wishes that people will come help him with it. Um, he's also thinking about trying to turn the Navajo Nation into a big permaculture project because it's the driest place in the United States. So they're, they've done a conference down there, and John Deleu was there, and then trying to figure out how to do it because if you see how they took the Lowest Plateau and, and turned it from that to that within 14 years, oh um, it was just amazing. 
Um, this is my house. This is my house and my project that I've been working on. You know, always grow hops up the west side of your house. It'll keep it cooler. You know, they're less messy than grapes. Mm. Uh, this is the project in Dayton that we did with Sepulzer. If you haven't been to Katarina's and you have the time to get over there and see it, she'd probably love to have any permaculture people over that might have missed it. This is another project that was done in Ryan in Dayton. Uh, Sepulzer's project with Katarina Hirsch owns the property. It's for sale. If anybody wants to start a really awesome permaculture place just up the road a little bit with a beautiful view of the lake. It's also really close to Mission Mountain Winery, isn't it? Uh -huh. So yeah, pretty, pretty much just right about street. a month. Yeah, cross street and up a few properties. So that's a fun highlight. So this is these are my food forests in the front yard. This is one of my Hugo culture beds that turned into a huge food forest in the backyard. This picture is like two or three years old, so everything is just humongous now, and it's really producing. In fact, my nectarines and peaches produce so much that they broke in half. And so always support your baby trees. Otherwise, you're big, producing, happy little trees. And don't let them produce so much. It's like making a mom produce at 14. So, um, this is the project I started at Crossroads Church in Big Fork. I wanted to give them a permaculture food forest. And so, this is when we built it. That's what it looked like a couple, a few, couple months later. And that's what it looks like when it rains a lot. So, I was so happy to see that it was capturing the rainwater. Um, so, and it, and it sits not having been watered for a couple of years now because they wouldn't give me a, they wouldn't put the money into a nice water system and I got tired of pulling hoses and I'm like, sorry, I was too busy with my very sick children and I had a, and we moved to Panama and came back and so these are just um, some places in the tropics that use, um, that use like biochar in their animal pens to keep the scent down and then they take the biochar out and that's goes to our compost piles and gets all jazzed and then it goes into feeding because in the tropics soil uh, was created in the Amazon by bi bi biochar. So Elaine Ingham, she's like so amazing. If you can just listen to any of it, Permaculture Voices has a lot of her talks, Dr. Elaine Ingham, and I'm serious, you will, you will have your mind blown and you will understand nitrogen in a way that you never have in the soil or or exudates from bacteria and how they're feeding the plant roots and how to feed them. Um, make sure you learn more about transition because that was those three things, food security, energy security, and local labor exchange. That's an easy way to talk without using the permaculture word to find communities together. And I can't remember, what's that website? It's like neighbor to neighbor or something. It's like the Facebook of your neighborhood. Jack talks about it all the time. So I am a total, I listen to podcasts every time I clean, do dishes, do the gardening or whatever. It's always on an app on my phone. Anytime I go into Wi-Fi, it automatically downloads the, the newest episodes. So, so load up a podcast app on your phone and subscribe to Permaculture Voices, the Permaculture Podcast, the Survival Podcast. Um, there's a lot now. Permies, of course, if you could, you know, some people, I've listened to all of Paul's, but it, you know, it takes a special person that can be happy about the way he says certain all things, but don't, you know, it's worth coming up, but. <laughs> but Permaculture Voices is all about how to make money from a piece of land in all these different ways, and if you like any things with animals or chickens, or you want to know anything more about that, it is really, truly so inspirational, and then catching any of the things from his uh, Permaculture Voices 1, 2, and 3 uh, talks are amazing. Um, yeah, so Sustainable World Radio, Jill Cloutier, she does an amazing job too. She quit doing it to raise kids, but everything that she has on there is amazing. I've got one of my interviews is on Permaculture Podcast about how um, I was like very anti-religion until I kind of had one of those little religious moments. And when I started reading the Bible, I'm like, oh my God, this is totally permaculture. This is totally permaculture because I knew permaculture before I knew the Bible. And so I have this whole book in my head called Permaculture in the Kingdom about how to, it's like a biblical prescription for permaculture. And so like it's all about how the Bible, it's, it, it totally supports that we should be doing permaculture 100% in order to have that God created experience that's, you know, everything is provided for us through creation kind of thing and we're meant to steward it. So, so I, I work with other people who have concepts like that too, like God produced no waste and it's just all these, you know, sort of Christian permaculture concepts all woven together to give 
not only Christians, but also non-Christians or non-anything, a way to have a dialogue without being offended or like you, you say, oh yeah, see, it says this right there, you know, and so, you know, you don't have to believe that like Christians are anti-ecology because really it's all over the Bible that that we're supposed to work together with it. So anyway, so that's kind of one of my, like, those books I'm supposed to write when I quit gardening. So, welcome home. Mm -hmm. That's it. Awesome. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all. Yeah.